night, I told you to give a scratch. Every night before my three-year-old goes to bed, he has to give me five things. He's added now six to it, but he has to come over. He has to give me a high five, a knuckle wrap, a scratch, a hug, a kiss. And now since Shantae has come back, it's added. You have to blow in his face and then give him a headbutt. So we're going to implement that here at E3 Church just to make sure that we're connecting and not just, you know, being and going through the normal day-to-day stuff. Uh, Are you guys ready? Are you excited this morning? I know I am excited. And uh, for the last several weeks, we have been in a series that is going to last officially 12 months. And we have titled it the Hero Challenge, where we're beginning to look at every area uh, God has put, put into our lives, the areas of our relationships, our finances, our emotional life and health, our spiritual life, all of these things, and look at them holistically so that we can approach them and begin to live out the very best and the, and the very utmost, everyone say utmost, It's always an interesting word. Anyways, the very utmost of what God has in store for us. And so last week, I started to sort of take us in a direction of really discovering our identity in Christ, who we are, and looking at what God has said about us, that this is not just some information, but there is the reality of the very nature of heaven living on the inside of us. The Bible says that we are partakers of his divine nature. And we responded with a hearty, shut up. Why? Because at this point, there's really nothing more that gives a hearty exclamation to it than just that statement right there. And so we we went through that last week. And this week, I want to sort of continue, but I want to look at something specifically. And let me start off by telling you a little story that uh, took place while I was on the green belt near my house. Oh, it's probably been a few months ago. And I was I was out kind of taking a, uh, a a walk, and I was just coming back from, uh, from the green belt, and I noticed that there was a small bird that was uh, injured, okay? This sounds like, you know, kind of, I don't know, anyway. So there was a small bird that was injured, and I sort of looked over to the side, and it, and it sort of bothered me just a tad bit, and some of you are very passionate bird lovers in here and would have rushed immediately. I didn't rush immediately. In fact, I looked at it, and then there were other birds coming down on it and attacking it, and I was just feeling really guilty, and I went inside, and I, and I told my wife and my, my uh, kids, and my daughter responded with, oh, dad, we, we must do something, and my wife responded with, just leave that thing. Can we, are we, aren't we having barbecue tonight? She didn't say that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I knew I was going to, I was going to get her on that one. Just kidding. So I took the uh, advice of my daughter, <clears throat> and we decided that we would go out and we would rescue it. And so we didn't know exactly what to do. And so we got a little shoebox and came outside. And then my son decided to get involved in this, my seven-year-old. And, uh, and so I don't know if you have ever, you know, seen or, or picked up an injured bird or just held a small hamster or whatever little creature it is. But, you know, we, we put this little, little thing in the box and there was just this kind of feeling and sense of there is this, this living thing that God's created, but it is in this box. And, uh, and so we took it and we took it over to, I can't remember the name of it. Sarah, what's the name of it? What is it? Liberty Wildlife. And we went over there and we dropped it off. And this is where all the birds that get injured, hit by golf balls and things like that from around town go. But uh, they took it and they restored it to health. And now it's a family pet. Just kidding, it's not. Um, but we left it there. And then I just, I thought about holding that living thing. And um, I don't know, it, it's, for me, it's been a little while since uh, I, I got to, for the very first time, hold our newborn, my wife and I's baby. And I know Paul and Christina could probably identify with this just a little bit, having a new baby. But as a dad, I don't know about for ladies, but as a guy, for the very first time, when you hold something that tiny and that small, you seriously, are, are, your heart starts beating a little bit faster. And in, in, in the, when you're at the hospital, they just hand it to you like you are supposed to know what to do with this thing, right? And, and there's no instructions, there's no nothing, but you are just, I mean, for me, I was in awe of just holding this little thing, how precious it is, and just, you know, and now, you know, we whip them around. Once you have a few, it's like, ah, they're resilient. But there is that preciousness, there is that preciousness of something that is living. Now, listen to this passage of Scripture. Hebrews 4.12, out of the Moffat's translation, it says, For the logos of God is a living thing. All right? God's word is a living thing. So this, 
this book that I hold in my hands, the same way that I, I held this little pigeon and I held my children that were precious life, God says that this is a living thing. You with me this morning? And this is a, a book that has the potential, and because it is a living thing, it's not just words, it's not just information, but it is something that is alive, that has the power to scrutinize and to, and to shine the spotlight, to feed and to nourish, to impart faith. This living thing right here, and build love and construct and energize. Now, one thing that I know that maybe it gets lost in sort of the shuffle of coming to service time and time again, or the culture in which we live, but I know that the way in which this thing, this living thing holds a piece of your heart, or I'll say the attitude that you have towards this determines really the place that God holds in your life on a day-to-day -day basis, the way that we look at it, the way that we respond to it. And I want us this morning to a new, fresh, I want us to, to re-engage with this thing that we've been given, which is life. And we're going we're gonna to read that passage of Scripture a little bit more, but I want to look at a few things as it pertains. Because I think when it comes to memorizing scripture and Bible reading plans and going to family Christian bookstores and everywhere else that information bombards us, I think we miss out on how precious the life and this living thing that God's given us certainly is. Are you with me? John 14, 23, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them. We will come to them. We, we will make our home with them. Isaiah 41.10 says, So don't, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. In other words, God gives us a declaration of his word that these words will literally come in and strengthen us, that they will literally come in beyond our own ability. God will lend his ability and impart strength when weakness comes, right? And he reminds us, I am the strength of your life. Now, how does that actually take place if you and I do not actually interact with it. I know I said the word actually three times. But if we don't receive of that strength, how will it be imparted to us if we don't hold the word of God in that way? Hebrews 4.12, let's read it in its entirety. For the logos of God is a living thing. It's active and more cutting than any sword with double edge, penetrating to the very division of soul and spirit, joints and in marrow, this is where the juice is, the life, scrutinizing the very thoughts and conceptions of the heart. And no created thing is hidden from him. Interesting little phrase that he'd drop in right there, right? We'll get to that in a second. All things lie open and exposed before the eyes of him with whom we have to reckon. I mean, here, here in this passage, we're talking about the Word of God, but then out of nowhere, we have this phrase, and no created thing is hidden from him. Him who? Who him? Who him, him, him? Who is the him that he's talking about? And why does he bring it up in the same reference to the Word of God? Well, how many of you know that during the first century that the church didn't have the written word that you and I have? In fact, everything was passed down orally. Everything, all, all that we have sitting right here before us was something that they memorized and they passed down to each other. And it wasn't until, uh, really, Paul's conversion 17 years after he was converted that he began to write down. First Thessalonians was his first passage and began to, to write out for us what you and I hold in our hands. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, We also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, right? You accepted it not as a human word, but, it, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. So 
right there, he's saying that you heard it from us. It wasn't something that we, we have in this form, in this function, but it was something that was passed down. And then if we look at Acts 19 and 20, it may help us to understand that it wasn't something written down. It says, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power because then at that time, they actually had something that was written. Back to Hebrews 4.12, where it says, who is this him that he's talking about? Now, those of us who, who spend a little time know that this thing, really when Jesus ascended up into heaven, he, he knew that he would give to us the Holy Spirit, but he would also give to us the word, and the word would become flesh. So this right here from the Bible is really the person and the personality of God. It's Jesus and he, when he says, and no created thing is hidden from him, he's telling us if we wish to fellowship with the Father, if we wish to have a rich relationship, then it's going to have to take place by grasping a hold of his living word. Are you with me? Have I shot way over your head? You and I have a chance to sit down every moment of every hour of every day and to be able to draw from life. Now, my question this morning is, what's your relationship to the word of God? What does it look like? I mean, is it a distant cousin? Is it something that, you know, is, is on a shelf somewhere? Is it, is it something that every once in a while or maybe, you know, condemnation and, and feeling guilty leads you to pick it up once in a while? Or is it something passion-filled? Is it something vibrant? Is it something that you look at and you recognize that this is precious? These are God's very words. They have the ability to transform and to change any circumstance or situation that you currently find yourself rehearsing over and over and over and over again. Has the ability to launch you out of your current circumstances beyond your education level, beyond what you currently know or where you currently are at status-wise. It has the actual power to lift and to transcend you out of that. Why? Because it is a living thing. Self-help books are neat, but they are not alive. Everyone say, it's alive. Now, I, I am having this kind of stirring, and, and I hope you're getting it. Like, this to me is, is becoming reality. This is not just, I'm not just passing along something that I think is neat. Hey, this is cool. Isn't that neat? Thanks. You guys have a great lunch. But really, because I see what takes shape, in each of our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, the difficulty, the transitions, the frustration, the ebb and flow. And, and, I, and I wonder, because just, just recently encountering people who have gone through some devastating things. I sat down this week with a gentleman who is a believer and, and his, who just found out that his son has leukemia. And he's, he's just, just doing everything he can and, and just sitting down and hearing month after month, week after week, their visits to the doctors and just not knowing whether life is coming or not. There's, there's nothing else for them to stand on except for the hope of the living word. I mean, nothing else. And I don't know what it is for you and I that, that kind of until a circumstance or situation takes place where we have no strength in and of ourselves that then puts us in a position. But I don't, you know, I don't know about you, but my Bible says that God takes us from glory to glory to glory, meaning that we don't have to crash and burn and then grab a hold of it and be like, oh yeah, I remember, it's a living thing. Let me wake up and let me grab that. Let me, let me hold on to it. Right now, in your current position, if you are exceeding, you can grasp a hold of this and recognize that God is not going to leave you nor forsake you in the good, the bad, or the ugly. But his desire and passion is to take you from glory to glory. And even though the circumstances that you thought were going to work out the exact way you thought they would work out, even though they're not working that way, it has no effect on what this living thing has to say about your future. Because God works all things together for, for good. And if you don't have a chance... To, to partake and to hold this in your hands, then you're missing out on the relationship just like you would if you were trying to get to know somebody of the opposite sex to have a relationship, and unfortunately, you were not pursuing them in a manner with actual conversation. How many of you know it probably wouldn't go very far? Or 
if you're in a marriage, as some of us understand and know, and time is passing and you've not really taken a moment to sit down and have an intimacy interview or, or a question and find out what's going on, it's easy for marital drift to take place as both people become stressed out by life and just sort of go through the passive motions. How many of you know that, that the vibrancy of that is not going to really give you a, a, a lot of joy in that relationship. And, and the same thing is true with our relationship with God. If we're not seeing it that way, and this is not passively reading over words and just sort of mimicking and, and, and letting our, our mouths just co- sort of wobble, but if we don't engage in the depth of this relationship and we, and we don't take attention to be able to stir the passion, well, then, then, then we can't uh, extract the benefits of the relationship. And how many of you want the benefits, which, which Jesus said, life beyond your wildest imaginations? The God who supplies all of your needs according to his riches and glory through his son, Christ Jesus. Now, if you want those things, then you have to actually engage in a relationship and conversation with the living thing, the source of all hope, the source of all life. Amen? Listen to what Jesus said. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus answered, it's written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jeremiah 15, 16, your words were found and I ate them and your words were to me a joy and the rejoicing of my heart for I am called by your name or O Lord God of hosts. It's pretty passionate right there. I mean, I've always heard this story, and, and it always has sparked a chord with me that when Hebrew children were raised, that their, their instructors or rabbis would take honey and they would drizzle it over the, the, the plates that they had to write on, and then they would have the kids lick so that they would recognize and create an association that God's word was sweet and it was good. When's the last time you licked your Bible? I mean, that's, that's really a great question, isn't it? I mean, when's the last time that you saw it as pleasant and a joy, and it just sort of, I I just came up with that on the spot, so don't give me a hard time on that one. But it is important for us to recognize that these words are, 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 are life, and they need to become to us more precious than the food that we eat. That before we get up and eat our breakfast, have our lunch, eat our dinner, that these words would become a hunger and a passion for us. Are you with me? Job 23, 12, we can learn something knowing that Job went through some hardships. Listen to what he says. I've not gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed and treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Man, that's pretty, that's pretty, that's pretty big. I mean, I know we've got some foodies in here, but I mean, I know you watch the Food Network, but right here Job is saying before, before you just follow that out, realize that this is the reality of, of life. It's the essence of everything that you have. Now, let me give you a couple of other things that we can interact with because these are areas that that become answers to the places, the pain points of our life. And as we begin to recognize how we can enter into a relationship with God's Word, then they become uh, eye-opening, heart-opening, transforming to our lives. Psalms 107.20 says, He sent His Word and He healed them. A living message from a living father, right? It's not, it's, it's now his, every word is from him to me, from him to you. He sends his words to bring wholeness, health, joy. Rome, Romans 10, 8 says uh, that this is, this book that we know is called the word of faith. This is the word of faith that this gives birth inside of the heart of a believer to the faith to be able to trust that God is who he says he is. Now, you and I probably spend time consulting natural circumstances more than we tend to consult the word of God, and that tends to put us in a place of stress. Has anyone ever been there? trying to figure it all out, trying to make it all happen, trying to, wondering where the money's going to come from, wondering how we're going to pay that off, wondering how we're going to get to where God's called us to get to. Now, left by yourself and all the craziness of that, you will go crazy. 
you will be stressed out and you will just use anything and everything to sort of coat that so you can deal. Am I, am I right about that? Has anyone ever done that? We all have, yes. But there's good news. And the good news is that we can interact. And the reality of the life that flows and throbs right here that lives in these pages is for now. And as we respond to it, it becomes life to us. Psalms 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd. Are you wandering? Are you just all over the map? Are you just confused? I'm preaching to not only you, but myself as well. Well, guess what? The Lord is your shepherd. He guides and he navigates. The things that you're trying to figure out right now, that you're dissatisfied, the Lord, he's your shepherd. John 10, 14, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Hey, more good news. Not only is he the shepherd, but he's a good one. He's a good shepherd. That means he's not going to beat you down. He is not going to hurt you and lead you astray into a gully, a ditch near a wolf. He's a good shepherd and he cares for his sheep and he will go after you and chase you down because he is good. Can I get an amen? Isaiah 41.10, fear not, I'm with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God. Be anxious for nothing. It's easy, God, easy. I mean, I got a lot of stuff that I'm trying to figure out right now and being anxious for everything would be more appropriate. But he says, be anxious for nothing, for I am your God. Romans 8, 31, if God be for you, who the heck can be against you? If you were to just sit down on a daily basis and recognize that those words are life, they're life, and, and if you've just made some changes career-wise or you've, you've, you've had some stumbles and, and places, refresh yourself to the fact if God be for you, who can be against you? I mean, that, that, there's some, some powerful truth. I'll, I'll keep going. <laughs> Philippians 4.13. We probably all know this, seen it on a bumper sticker. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Psalms 27.1. God is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Philippians 4.19. My God shall supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Psalms 121.1, my help comes from the Lord. Psalm 62.5 through 8 says that God, he is my refuge. Now, Sarah, if you missed uh, our prayer this, this past week, I, I, I'd encourage you to not miss the next one. Now, I'll tell you why. Um, in fact, some of us may, be, may have come, I won't name names, but we may have come with a little bit like, Okay, I did this before. I, I, went to the, I went to the church prayer meeting where everybody does the, the church praying. And honestly, I'm, I'm just going to pass on that because it's a little weird and everybody tries to show off how they pray. Well, one of the things that she did, and for those of you who feel a little bit intimidated or, or you're not quite sure what to do as far as praying and maybe, you know, you hear somebody pray and they have a lot of words to say and you're like, Jesus. And that's all you know. And so you sometimes feel intimidated. Well, one of the practices that she had us do that I thought was fantastic, and I would encourage each of you to do this so that you could start to understand the power of prayer and how to start praying, was to take passages of Scripture. So we, we talked about being partakers of the divine nature, to read that passage of Scripture out loud, and then to pray it. So it would go something like this, if God before you, who can be against you? Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are the king of my heart, you're the king of everything, and that your word declares that you are for me, not against me. Help me to understand with clarity, God, that you're not after me, that you are not trying to count up all my mistakes against me, but that you are for me. In the middle of bosses and transitions and changes that come that are difficult for me to be able to even think about, you are are for me. Even though the neighbors down the street have been talking about me and my girlfriends or whatever, boyfriends, whatever, are talking bad, you're still for me. Nothing can change that. Nothing ever will. I'm going to stick my anchor in that, and I'm going to live with confidence and, and a surety knowing that you are for me and that you're working all things together for good. Simple. Start to take it and to, and to, 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 to go through it and start to read it and guess what happens? John 8, 31 says, abide 
in my word. Let my, let my words live in you. Because when they do, they're me. This is me. This is God sent his word and he healed them. This is, this is he, him. Now, I'm going to be quiet here because I'm over my time. Last but not least, this, this it gets me excited too. As we let the word of God begin to dwell in us, as we begin to see it as a living thing and precious, and we begin to change how we've been responding to it, and we start to passionately and romantically engage with it again, listen what happens. Jeremiah 1.12, Then said the Lord to me, You have seen well, for I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. So as we begin to allow these words to live in us, as we begin to speak forth God's living, precious words over our lives, our situations, our spiritual life, emotional life, recreational life, financial life, physical life, as we begin to speak the word, God is hovering like he was in Genesis 1 when it says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters and when God spoke the word, bam, created things took shape. Do you have that sense of awe about this, this book right here? Do you have a picture this morning of, of something fresh and new that hopefully causes you to say, you know what, I better get after this because this is pretty exciting. God watches over his words to perform it. And as we're taking new steps in life, new businesses that we're launching out in, uh, being new parents and, and all the responsibility that comes with it, and change and transition and things that we aren't sure of because it's uncertain, but you and I weren't created to lead, lead lives of certainty. We were called to trust and to follow God. And there's only one way that that can happen, and that's by putting our hope in his word and by living as individuals aware of who God made us to be so that we could walk differently and according to the plan and purpose that he has for us. Can I get a, oh yeah. yeah. Did you get anything? Yes. Okay, three of you, awesome. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, that the entrance of your word brings light and life Father, I ask that you would forgive us for missing how precious and powerful and how alive this that you've given us is. Father, for spending our time anxious, worry, regrets, fumbling around over loss and other things that have kept us heavy. Father, would you refresh us this morning with newness of life, the heart of passion. Help us to understand that the words that you've given to us came at a great price. It came down from the first century church with great struggle, with lo lives lost as people stuck everything on the line, who gave 100%. And as we sit in an air-conditioned building with all kinds of different leather coverings on our Bible and cool translations, I'd ask, Father, that you awaken us and, and get us out of the sort of comatose state just existing in our culture so that we would once again refresh and revive the very Word of God and let it live and abide and dwell richly within us. Allow us to look to the maker of life and the king of heaven and earth and all things, the kingdom that you've come to establish, Lord let those words dwell in us. Allow us to speak them freely, speak them over our situations, our circumstances, so that we can watch as you begin to perform it. Because we don't want to live boring. We want to live supernatural. We want to live in the unexplainable, the things that we can't make happen. Because God, if we do, then we have to settle for what we can make happen. But in you, you do all things go beyond what we can ever imagine or expect. And we want that. In Jesus' name. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed this morning, real quick, if you're here and you don't have a relationship with God, with a perfect Heavenly Father who loves you unconditionally and has good things in store for your life, maybe you grew 
up around church or people that called themselves Christian and they sort of made you upset because the things that they did and the things that they said did not look like the love and compassion and mercy and grace that's depicted in the Bible. If you're here this morning and you'd like to have a fresh relationship started anew by responding to the finished work of the cross, all that Jesus did for you, would you lift your hand and say, that's me. Anybody this morning? Thank you. Anyone else? Say, that's me. All right. We're going to pray together out loud. Everyone say this. Say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on a cross, shed his blood for every sin. The ones I've committed, the ones I might commit five minutes from now. Thank you for rising again so that we could have newness of life. Be transformed by your love, by your grace, by your mercy, 